Hi again, guys. Um, here's your quantum scattering problem. Um, and again, please make sure that you uh, talk to me if some of this stuff is, is more difficult um, or frustrating um, than um, you anticipated. Uh, I'll just say straight up, this was the hardest stuff when I was an undergraduate. So, And, and we're kind of breezing through this in, in less than two weeks, partly because of the collapsed schedule uh, that we're on. We're just fitting out our toolkit for future use. And um, the main points here really come down to the Cauchy Integral Theorem, which allows us to do contour integrals, the Laurent uh, Theorem, which allows us to do expansions, and then both the Residue Theorem, which allows us to do integrals, and the Principal Value, which allows us to do integrals on the real axis. All of this takes us to how do we take something that looks like it's impossible to integrate, and instead of integrating it, we use algebra, right, at, at worst. So the example that I got to right before the end of class today uh, was a problem in quantum scattering. This is an integral that will pop up in uh, quantum scattering. And the um, question is, how do, you, how do you do this, short of just going to Mathematica, right? Um, so what we'll do is uh, first we'll use sine of z is equal to 1 over 2i e to the i z minus 1 over 2i e to the minus i z. And then i uh, sigma is equal to i1 plus i2. Okay. Um, with our definition that i1 is equal to 1 over 2i from minus infinity to infinity of z e to the i z over z squared minus sigma squared dz. And i2 is equal to minus 1 over 2i from minus infinity to infinity of z e to the minus i z over z squared minus sigma z squared, sigma squared dz. What I mean by that is that, um, and I mentioned this at the end of class, is that we have, depending on which way this uh, wave is going, we have, uh, clearly we have poles at minus sigma and plus sigma. And so we can have a contour integral that moves like this in the upper half plane. Actually, this should go out more. Um, that, this is I1. I2 is the other case. Namely, uh, we have our pole at minus sigma and plus sigma. And now um, we are excluding a different All right, so uh, so we have uh, poles, obviously, at sigma and minus sigma, okay? So our next step is what? Give you a second to think of what we should do here first. Okay, if you said find the residues, you're right. If you didn't, that's okay. You've only been dealing with this for a day and a half. So step one here is find the residues for both cases. So for I1 at Z equals sigma, we have E uh, I e to the I sigma over two. If you just look at what that uh, function looks like, and at z equals minus sigma, we have e to the minus i sigma over 2. In other words, uh, consider the function z e to the i z over z squared minus sigma squared, right? That is where we get um, those residues, you can see that um, we're going to have a residue over here at 
sigma and sigma minus, the residue itself is going to be what's on top of that expansion, right? Okay, and remembering that we have a, a 2i on the outside of that. Um, for i2, we have for z equals sigma e to the minus i sigma over 2 and e to the i sigma over 2. Right. So for both of these intervals, we have our sets of residues. Right. Um, just to make this uh, more clear, because I think maybe this this gobbledygook over here isn't. If, if we think of z e to the i z over z plus sigma times z minus sigma, that means that a minus 1 for positive sigma is equal to z minus sigma times f at z equals sigma. That was the first equation that started the day. So that equals z minus sigma times sigma e to the i sigma over 2 sigma. And of course, we're basically getting rid of uh, the thing that makes it singular, and that gives us the 1 half e to the i sigma. Okay, so that's where this comes from. And you can do the, and you may want to practice and confirm these other three. Okay, now we use step two, the residue theorem. And in particular, what we'll look at then is the, the different ways to, to write this. Uh, I can write, I'll write it usually as the principal value, pi, minus pi i, one over two i, e to the minus i sigma over two, plus pi i, one over two i, e to the i sigma over two. Just as a reminder, right? These are our two residues, and we're only taking half of those. This is the same as that, that interval along the x-axis, right? The Cauchy principal value. Um, this is all equal to, uh, two pi i over two i e to the i sigma over two for z equals sigma. And if we look at uh, pi, um, the principal value i2, we have minus pi i minus over two i plus pi i minus one over two pi e to the minus i sigma, oops, over two, and that equals minus two pi i minus one over uh, minus two i e to the i sigma over two. And so this is all for sigma um, or for z equals sigma. In, uh, in both those intervals. So P i, what we would write then is the principal value of that total interval at sigma is equal to the principal value one, principal value of two, and that equals pi halves times e to the i sigma plus e to the minus i sigma, which happily enough, is pi times cosine of sigma. Okay, so in other words, we solve for that. So again, I think I mentioned this. This is, yay, we've solved this complicated um, integral. But, boo, this is not uh, an outgoing wave. So this is not the form of an outgoing wave. 
cosine sigma is the form of a standing wave. Oh no. So one of the things that we can do is um, do the following trick. Let's let sigma go to sigma plus i gamma and minus sigma go to sigma minus i gamma. What that eventually, what that essentially is saying is uh, we are taking our poles and um, we are moving them just a little bit down and a little bit up, okay, uh, from our contours. And we can make them fully into the contours. Um, this is something I suggested as an alternate uh, path to uh, evaluating these intervals. Now we can look at i plus sigma is equal to the limit as gamma goes to zero of i of sigma plus i gamma. Remember, we're multiplying it by i because we're in the complex plane, right? Um, so i minus, or i sub 1 of gamma plus i, or sigma plus i gamma is equal to 2 pi i times 1 over 2 i. Now we've encapsulated it in, in the contour. So now we have e to the i sigma plus i gamma over 2, just using the residue theorem. And i2 sigma plus i gamma is equal to minus 2 pi i. We're going in the opposite direction now. Times minus 1 over 2i times e to the i sigma, it's an i there, plus i gamma over 2. And so we have for our outgoing wave, i sigma is equal to the limit as gamma goes to zero. As we start to bring that back down uh, to the uh, x-axis of i1 sigma plus i gamma plus i2 sigma plus i gamma. And that's equal to the limit of gamma goes to zero of, we we'll just add this all up, pi e to the i sigma plus i gamma. And that equals pi e to the i sigma. Which does have the former, is, is uh, suggestive of an outgoing scattered wave. So, um, why don't you look this over and uh, let me know what you think. Uh, this is, another, again, another application of complex analysis. Uh, one other complication, or application that I wanted to, that, that does something similar is a Green's function problem, but I'm gonna hold off on that till we do Green's functions. So anyway, again, um, if this is complicated, if it's complex, ha ha, it is only because it is. And uh, you guys are doing great. Keep it up and let me know how you're doing, okay? I really am here for you and want you to, to do really well. Um, and I know you can, all right? All right, I'll see you on Wednesday, if not before. Bye.